we are now going to transition from um, the talks part of the Eagle 40 piece of this workshop to the panel. And so I'm gonna hand it off to Jitendra and Drew who are chairing this panel. And thanks again to all our speakers. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, should we give people a break? Uh, any advice on this? Okay, maybe we'll just uh, power right ahead. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so uh, uh, okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on your time zone. And actually, I suspect many people will be uh, watching this panel, uh, you know, much uh, later, post hoc with respect to where we are today. So uh, my name is Jitendra Malik. It's been my privilege to be part of this, uh, this great effort of uh, collecting EgoFOD, which sometimes I think of this as the mother of all data sets, because it has 3000 hours of video. It has, uh, if you calculate it, it's like 10 million seconds. If you want to think of it in terms of frames, it's like 300 million frames. In terms of annotation, it's hundreds of thousands of hours and so on and so forth. But if you think of it from the, the scientific collaboration point of view, this is, this is big science in, for which in computer vision is not so common. We have a paper with 80 authors or more than 80 authors and uh, I've been in computer vision for 35 years, perhaps for the people in this room, maybe I'm the one who's been around the longest. And, and this is the paper that I've uh, uh, been part of, which is the one with the, the, the biggest on any of these uh, metrics that we can, where we, can, uh, we can list. So big science came in physics in the era of say Lawrence, and then high energy physics is these papers with thousand authors. In biology, again, it used to be small science, but when it came to sequencing the human genome, they needed to have these big teams with hundreds of authors. Well, in computer vision, when we talk about uh, uh, building uh, the right kind of data set for research in our field, we needed to have an effort of this scale. So it's a, it's a stupendous effort. And first of all, I want to thank uh, Kristen and uh, and the five benchmark leads, uh, Bernard, Chris, Vamsi, uh, Jim, and uh, Giovanni for presenting the, the essence of the, of the data set and the benchmarks. So in this panel, we are going to take a more a broader view going, uh, going forward, what are the problems that we can solve and should solve, as well as an opportunity for all the other PIs of this project to have a say. So uh, we're gonna go around and uh, uh, this team we had of you know, 13 universities, in addition to Facebook research, people should get a chance to uh, give their anecdotes, their thoughts and so forth. Uh, but before I go down that path, I want to uh, particularly acknowledge uh, Andrew Westbury, or Drew Westbury. He has, uh, he has uh, been the project manager of this on the Facebook side and responsible for the liaison with universities, liaison with efforts on uh, de-identification, on uh, legal, uh, dealing with diplomacy, uh, then efforts on annotation and then coordination with the, coordinating with the various benchmark teams. Somehow there is this massive project and it had many, many components and the one person who was on top of it every day, trying to make sure that we were moving uh, along was uh, Drew. So thank you very much, Drew. And uh, uh, we appreciate your effort. I want to uh, turn now to our, uh, some of our colleagues who did not speak in the previous group, but have a chance to speak. And I want to first ask Dima, because uh, in a sense, Dima's work on EPIC was was a really a, a precursor to this work. And as I've said to Dima many times before, I really love that work. So Dima, you have the floor. Thanks, Sandra, and thanks everyone. It's been exciting seeing this, um, attending and watching all the benchmarks. I wrote a few comments, each one of us was gonna give a few minutes. And I, I, I get asked, like many of us here have been in Ego for a while. Um, so what did we, 
learn additionally from the exercise in addition to the diversity and the scale and all the other things. And I have to admit that watching the footage is changing my perspective about egocentric vision. Having seen all the footage before, all the previous data sets, there is a level of excitement going into new places and with new people and with new activities that is really changing my perspective into what egocentric vision can offer, despite being in the field for a while. It has introduced problems in my head that I haven't thought about or explored. And it's also questioned this notion of diversity. And I like a quote from, from, Mike, from Michael Ray when he was watching the footage, he was saying, there is this big distinction between indoors and outdoors around the world. When you look at the indoors footage, globalization has impacted our indoor environment and it's making it look somehow similar. So, you know, you look at an indoors and you say, oh, it's very similar. But when you look at the outdoors, that's when you understand the global aspect of how different the world still is and how the globalization really has an impact. Maybe we all wash the dishes in the same way or most of us, but when we go about how we do our jobs and how we work outdoors, this is very, very different. And also being in hands and objects for a while, I always thought, and we've all played with these kitchen-based activities, and we thought kitchen is really where all the hands and objects can be analyzed. Looking at the data set, it's like hands and objects are everywhere, even in activities that are like social and other things. So that excites me a lot. Just to touch on one topic I we all get asked is, why did these participants participate? No, why did they do it? Why did they take these cameras and, and record? And uh, most of these, and this was very much uh, triggered by Kristen, she said, we don't want grad students. The grad students have the intensive in, in incentive. They want to collect the data to work on it. But why would a 60 years old somewhere in Scotland collect data for Ego4D? And of course, these are technology enthusiasts, right? To be sent cameras by post and to be learned or taught on Zoom how to collect the data. So there is an element of, you know, they're not completely covering people who might never want to use cameras. So they're technology enthusiasts, but they really want to know. They really want to, to hear about what's happening. And they keep emailing us saying they want to be informed. So we, we have a mailing list just to tell them what's happening in the project. People want to know what the technology is offering. And this is a time consuming step to answer their questions, to refine, because we haven't thought what a 50 plus years old, 60 plus years old has in terms of if they haven't been in the computer vision community. Um, and we are sharing the data before we've analyzed it in full. And some of the questions people ask today, like, have you analyzed? We're going down the route of say community analysis. We're giving the data out, having explored parts of it and some of its benchmarks and hoping that by sharing early on, we're gonna explore the the crowd analysis and see what others can do with the data. The data is bigger than any of us can watch or review. We've all seen samples and snippets, and um, it will be very exciting to see what others will be able to see in this footage. I just watched some of the snippets and it excites me a lot. And it excites me to the level of thinking, egocentric is now too big. Even all these groups and all these students are not gonna be enough to solve all those challenges. So please join us in uh, tackling Ego4D, the 84 different authors are, are all needed and we need others to tackle some of these challenges. And thanks Jitendra for getting me the floor to speak first. Uh, thank you, thank you Dima. And, uh, and then uh, let me just note uh, that this data collection had to be done at the time when the entire world was in the grip of a pandemic it has not seen before. So just think about that. I mean, this data set is going to be around for years, but we had to do this collection at a time when the world had sort of shut down and we were still trying to make this project happen. And uh, uh, history will judge how successful we were. So in keeping with the, with, with the diversity theme here, uh, I want to move to Asia. And we have three representatives from Asia here. So we have India, we have Singapore, we have Japan. So I'm going to start and I, I guess going eastward. So Jawahar, uh, can you tell us your thoughts about either the data collection or about this data set or what you see as uh, exciting in the future? So 
I think I look at this now as uh, like we are getting into a phase where we are going to see how AI system will have to work with human in the midst of the human. So the, the challenges related to the diversity, the cultural issues, the social issues for will be exposed in this data set or in this data set and possibly the challenges that are going to be thrown by this data set well beyond our benchmark. Maybe novel objects, novel way of doing things, novel like situations where the AI system has to live or AI system has to perform. So I personally look at uh, this sort of a system to be leading towards as a assistant to human or assisting human in like a critical task like when there is a danger. So when there is a danger, can this pursue this danger and proactively help human? or providing information assistance. So there are a number of very interesting socially relevant tasks that could evolve out of this data set. And I hope this is going to be a beginning for that. Thank you, Jawahar. Uh, Mike, would you like to be next? Yes, thank you, Jitendra. Uh, hello, everyone. Mike Shaw from National University of Singapore. So actually it's pretty early morning here, like 4 a.m. So pardon me if I tend to be kind of like sleepy. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm personally very honored to be part of this consortium. And actually through this journey, learned a lot from all other PIs and all the students. Uh, in terms of research topic, I'm recently more focused on long form video understanding thing. And I think this epic uh, and ego 40 data set uh, provide great opportunity for us because usually when we deal with like kinetics, it's just 10 seconds long and we can only do like video classification step. But with this ego 40 data set, people record the video continuously for like hours uh, and we could have some high level events that last for a long time. And we would be able to really make sense of what happened maybe uh, as like for example, 4 a.m. here and maybe what we are going to predict what happened maybe half hour later. Uh, so I think this provides a great opportunity for us to study long form. And also I think it's also amazing that we narrate this video um, with, uh, with the textual descriptions. Uh, as we see, there is a trend of using this uh, correspondence between uh, video and uh, uh, language stuff. So as it's, I think this also provides a great opportunity for us to maybe combine this ego for the data set and later with supervised learning methods. Uh, and, and also maybe one last thing I want you to, I think people may have mentioned this already, but I just want to stress that is the privacy. Uh, I think this is actually a really, very important issue that and I'm, uh, I, I find it's fortunate for us to actually respect privacy issue in this project. Uh, many in this kind of phase data set uh, have been actually taken down due to the privacy issue. And this really kind of like bump up because like researchers want to be able to compare different methods uh, on the same benchmark. And uh, so I think our data set actually provide not only vision community, uh, computer vision community, or it can actually go beyond and like, uh, allow uh, maybe NLP people and other domains people to really uh, safely working on this data set without worrying about our model or this data set, okay, will be taken down someday in the future. Yes, that's just my uh, few thoughts, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, yeah, let me uh, pick on Mike's point and echo, uh, amplify that a bit. The fact is that we have this 3000 hours of video and it has been narrated. So we, we are, there is a commentary in uh, text on what the person uh, is doing, what the ego person is doing. And this is amazing because this gives us a way to ground language. So there's a lot of excitement in AI today about models like BERT which have been trained on uh, data from the internet like Wikipedia and, and text. But this is learning of language, qua language, that's just in text space. That language is not grounded in the physical world. Whereas if you think about children growing up, their language is grounded in the world. When they talk about a bottle, that bottle refers to a certain physical object, which can be recognized from its pixels and manipulated by the hand of the child. And the, the ego 4D data set will enable us to, to tackle problems of that ilk. So this is one of the possibilities. Uh, 
Now, continuing with Asia, I, may I turn to Sato san. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for joining Dijendra. Uh, my name is Yoichi Sato. I'm from University of Tokyo. Uh, I would like to say a few words on our data collection. Uh, so, like uh, in this project, uh, we focus on uh, two single person activities that involves a lot of fine object, uh, uh, fine hand object interactions in collateral scenes. In particular, we collected uh, 90 hours of videos of cooking and 51 hours of videos of handcraft, such as making origami and plastic models. And also we try to uh, have a well-balanced group of participants in terms of gender and age uh, in order to collect diverse behavior patterns. Um, so we recruited uh, 41 male and 40 uh, female Japanese participants in their 20s to 60s. Uh, so like uh, after collecting the, those videos, uh, we clearly see that the, the current state of the art, uh, the techniques for hand object interaction analysis, for instance, uh, are not enough. Uh, especially uh, for uh, handicraft video analysis because of like so many uh, small objects and also like uh, so, uh, so many uh, occlusions and also like a uh, free form objects. So uh, we clearly see like, uh, like uh, those challenges uh, present. So uh, we uh, really hope uh, these uh, data sets uh, will be uh, useful for uh, to do uh, for doing research on the, uh, not only on the various benchmarks we discussed today, but also finding uh, new uh, additional important challenging tasks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, so we are going around the globe. So maybe now I have to walk around and come to the Americas, but I'm going to start in the South. So uh, Pablo Arbela is my old friend and colleague, and it's been a pleasure to collaborate with you again on ego 4 d Thank you, Jitendra. So we are delighted to represent the region in this effort. We joined the consortium earlier this year. So uh, we focused our collection efforts mainly in the summer. And in a way, we were lucky because uh, our delay with respect to the other groups allowed us to leverage from their experience to fast track our collection. And also um, concerning what Jitendra was uh, mentioning some of the pandemic restrictions were lifted here in Colombia, so uh, we could uh, contribute with uh, multi-camera group activities. So we had uh, groups of uh, 15 to 20 people, all of them doing an activity together for uh, two to four hours. So some examples of those scenarios are uh, lessons, uh, climbing lessons or dancing lessons, also some um, free form of the outdoor scenarios like uh, hiking in a natural park or uh, exploring a downtown and uh, also more structured scenarios like a day in a molecular lab or uh, administrative work. So uh, we collected about 600 hours, 70 individual users and a small fraction of it made it to uh, release 1.0. The, the rest is being processed for uh, the next release, and we are very excited about uh, the problems, the new problems this data set enables, in particular those at the intersection of uh, vision and language, which is a topic in which uh, we are actively working. Thank you, Pablo. And now we return to North America and uh, I guess the Midwest. Uh, so it's uh, David uh, Crandall, maybe you go next. Sure, I'm happy to. I don't really have any brilliant thoughts that haven't yet been said. I'll just make sort of two quick points. The first is that I think egocentric vision has always been a sort of small part of the mainstream computer vision community. And I remember like when I first, maybe 10 years ago, started talking about it with my students, they were like, you know, what are you even talking about? Like mounting cameras on people. Like, why would anybody care about that? And yet I think, you know, Ego 4D is really this opportunity to now bring egocentric vision into the mainstream, because as others have said, wearable camera data is inherently human centric. It captures the actual visual fields of people as they go about their lives. And in fact, maybe we could make the argument that egocentric vision is really the only part of computer vision that matters, because vision is really only defined in terms of like agents who are observing the world. Otherwise, it's just like photons bouncing around and not being observed by anything. So maybe in computer vision uh, 
community in the future, maybe data from YouTube or Flickr or TV or movies or surveillance or whatever will be the thing that seems artificial and maybe the, the sideshow to, to egocentric vision, which is the, the core part of the field. Um, maybe not, but that, that, that is a vision that I think many of us have. And, um, and then the other second, uh, the other point I wanted to make is, of course, one of the limiting factors has been collecting data. And it's really hard to do this in the, for egocentric vision. And so, you know, I just wanted to thank, uh, thank Kristen and Drew and Jatendra and, and everyone else for their vision in making this happen. And I think somewhere in this project, we should have maybe a little paper where we describe the zillion logistical challenges and zillion like interesting stories that happened as we were collecting this data, because as Jatendra said, it was very challenging during a pandemic. It was also very challenging, I know, to coordinate different legal and IRB kind of situations across different states and countries. For the social benchmark, for example, for, during the pandemic, we were trying to figure out how to recruit people, how to risk health of participants, how not to risk health of participants and investigators, how to get like the devices to people, and importantly, how to get them back. And on one hand, this is really challenging, but actually it was also turned out to be an opportunity in many cases because it sort of forced us to think about doing collection in, in the home as opposed to the lab in order to not, because we couldn't bring people into the lab. And people, at least we found, were actually unusually willing for, to, to participate because they had nothing better to do. I mean, I had one site where, uh, one home that I showed up with and they actually had put a big banner that said, welcome David on, on the front door because they were so excited about it. Um, so anyway, and this is just one, one aspect aspect of think of the interesting stories and there's a ton of other interesting stories about how an anonymization was done how synchronization was done how normalization was done across multiple cameras and encoders and modalities and so on um, so anyway i think this is such a great opportunity and i think it's been such a fun and interesting challenge thank you david uh hansu you get to have the last word with respect to the pis all right, thank you. So uh, I'm Hansu Park from the University of Minnesota, and I'm very honored to be part of this uh, grandiose uh, Eagle 40 project. And before moving on, I'd like to acknowledge my students, like three PhD students and more than 10 undergrad students have been working on this Eagle data collections, annotations, and, and test formulations. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's impossible without their help. So earlier, uh, the Mike and Jitendra make a very interesting point about the language grounding. So yeah, I'd like to make a, some controversial point here. Uh, the, so I think what differentiates the third person vision from the egocentric vision is the ability to observe the perceived and the actor's point of view, and that provide the very strong signals to understand the activities. And uh, uh, I think that the third person video, to some extent, it is a grounded in 3D context, at least the gravity aligned videos and so on. I mean, we always see the, uh, the third person video, this is uh, intentionally, unintentionally, we actually take your pictures you know, from, the, uh, from the tripod and so on. So we have data that is gravity aligned, at least it is physically grounded. But however, in the same time, I argue that the first person videos that we have seen is not really the physically grounded. The activities occur in the context of the 3D scene, but everything is seen from the egocentric uh, coordinate systems, which is now aligned with uh, the, the, the physics, uh, the physical co coordinate system. So uh, I think the, the, my personal dream of this egocentric project, uh, Ego 4D uh, project is to enable not only like 3D, 2D understanding of detections and localization, but also 3D, uh, meaning that reconstructing every pixel that you observe uh, from the egocentric videos uh, in a physically grounded fashion. So I think is in the future, we we'll make we really need to make an effort to uh, ground on the physics. Uh, uh, and, and of course we provide a subset of uh, ego, study, ego 40 data uh, in, uh, in the, the pulls of camera as a register in the Metaport scan or IMU, but I think it's really uh, important for us to like, really push, push forward uh, to the, the physically grounded perceptions. Thank you, Hansu. Yeah, I, I share your perspective. I think, in fact, uh, ego 4D. So there's the ego part and then there's the 4D part. And uh, I think we need to remind people of, of the 4D part, which means that there is a 3D world in which we are moving in time and that provides uh, constraints. And, and that is in a sense, the essence of vision. 
and it's also the essence of robotics. Machine learning, in a sense, is about data and finding patterns in the data and so forth, but it could be on any kind of data. But in vision and robotics, we are dealing with a specific data, which is that which comes from a three-dimensional world in which we are moving in time. And, and I think uh, uh, we have to have that awareness and we have to have ways of exploiting that, which is not currently common in the paradigm. I mean, often, uh, I mean, the last many years have been the success of machine learning techniques, which are somewhat generic in nature. And I appreciate them and use them, but I feel that there is, there is some juice left to be squeezed out from the fact that we are in this, this 4D world. And I hope that this ego 4D data will, will do that for us. History tells us that uh, data sets influence the direction of the field. So uh, in the last 20 years, computer vision has been very influenced by that and the influence of ImageNet and Coco and so on. And then at some point it hits diminishing returns, right? So you're fighting for 84% versus 85% on, on ImageNet. It's not clear to me how much that matters, but a new data set forces you to think about the problem in new ways. And I feel that uh, a lot of what, even the benchmarks that we have, I think people will find better benchmarks. People will find new ways to annotate the data. History tells us that data sets always get used in ways that were not anticipated by their creators. So in a certain sense, we, should we are we we, are, we we get to contribute the pixels and then the semantics will keep getting added by 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 others of our colleagues to come in the years to come and uh, I, I i appreciate that i savor that i don't want us to be in the mode that oh this is what we created and this is pristine and you shall not mess with it i think it's for everybody this data set is not just ours it's for everybody and for everybody to harness their creativity so with that, just I think to follow up on, on, on what yeah. Hansu was yeah. uh, saying in terms of 3D and whether we should we needed to collect everything in 3D. Uh, I am a fan of, of Kristen's paper of Egotopo, where, where you have an understanding of the world, but not in metrics that are necessarily actual 3D. In fact, as humans, if you ask us to draw a 3D map of even the rooms we live in, some of us are really good at it, but some of us are bad, are really bad at figuring out the distances of things, but we know roughly their proportions and how things are around. So um, I take Hanson's uh, question about whether everything needed to be grounded only in language, I understand, but I also don't think it needs to be grounded in the actual physics of metrics of the world and everything. And 4D is necessarily the metric level 3D. Um, and thus I think lots can be done with footage that's collected with only 2D with a lot of thinking about perceptual graphs. And maybe Kristen, um, you know, has a lot to say on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we can have it both ways too, right? I mean, even thinking of topological spatial organizations of the space is, um, you know, has 3D or physical aspects informing and it's maybe it's a big spectrum, right, of where where we're trying to model or what we're trying to leverage. So uh, I want to uh, thank you. Uh, so I, it's uh, the discussion is very much open. So if people in the audience have questions, please uh, uh, put them up and uh, we'll try to uh, pick on them. Otherwise, uh, uh, panelists can generate questions and all else fails, I will generate questions. <laughs> Okay, I actually have a question, have a question related to, to, to the social benchmark, which, um, so we collected lots of data where faces have been blurred, but still lots of social interaction has been captured. And I acknowledge that the natural aspect of social or AV has been with, with physical faces, but I'm wondering how, how Jim and, and Vamsi feel about the type of footage we've collected with people at home playing games, but not feeling confident about face sharing their faces. Amsi, do you want to go? Sure. 
So this is a great point, uh, Dima. I think like um, it's not yet clear from psycho uh, psychophysics, both visual as well as uh, visual cognition as well as acoustic cognition, that we need to capture high resolution facial expressions to understand conversations. I don't think there is evidence for that. There is there is evidence both against and pro for it. Um, what there is evidence for is if you uh, if a conversation has started, if you already captured some of the simple nuances like usage of hands and gestures, the ability to move and you know move gestures, move head around quite a lot. If these kind of meta attributes are already captured, then I can anonymize the face and blur it and still be able to understand what the speaker is trying to say, whether they're attending to person one or person two. So it, it, some of these questions are still uh, still a little bit open, which is another way of saying that with the anonymized data, both the anonymized data and the non-anonymized data are both useful. Uh, uh, we can ask the same question on both of these data sets, both of these attributes, and end up with answers that are wildly different, and which is one of the biggest uh, questions in, uh, at least in uh, acoustic cognition, uh, maybe visual cognition, uh, things are a little bit better because the, the field itself is a little bit old. So uh, long story short, what I'm trying to say is that it's still rich data. It's good data. We want to use it. In fact, we want to throw the same tasks at it and see how bad or how different uh, we will end up with. Maybe discover new tasks that we need to go back and revise the whole benchmark. Yeah, just to add to that, I agree with Amsi. And I think, you know, I think it also depends upon the models, right? So we we're kind of still in the business of building these rather shallow models that are driven a lot by the statistics of the data itself and often not much more. And if that's the business you're in, then you know every signal is really valuable. I think as we move towards models that are richer and more informed by, you know, the 3D context as already mentioned, I think the human context is also really important, right? All this data was collected by humans. We know a lot about humans, you know, about how they move and how they perceive their world, and you know, that's a rich literature that we haven't really begun to exploit yet. So, so the more we leverage those additional modalities, if you will, then I think you may discover you need less, you know, in terms of pixels. But we're definitely not there yet. Just to add one point, uh, sorry, I forgot to add that. I think one of the biggest things that we have yet not, not explored enough is this aspect of turn taking. Uh, how is it? How is turn taking defined uh, uh, in a conversation versus how is it defined right now? For example, I'm speaking and. Uh, Hopefully, most of you are listening. So, um, so this turn taking is fundamentally different from, let's say, I have three people and they're all interacting with each other, and somebody's talking more, somebody's talking less. That aspect, we may have need to come up with a new type of tasks, uh, which define new ways of understanding subjective turn taking, personalized turn taking versus objective turn taking. Meaning, I, I want to impress somebody else versus I want to have a conversation. These two mean totally different things. So when we when we define those subtle nuances, um, we need this anonymized data. We need unsupervised data in the wild data. Uh, we don't need fully structured, uh, nicely looking, be anonymized data like what we have right now. So everything we take what we get. Excellent, Jitendra. Yeah. Yes, we we do have one, one. We have one question from the uh, from the audience. Um, I'm not sure if you captured that, but it's just a, a question for David um, in which, you know, if he could share other interesting stories or challenges that occurred while collecting the data. This is just kind of, I think it's a general question for the consortium. David referenced, there's quite a lot of stories to tell and yeah. there was a question related so, to- so we, should have a, we should be, we, we need to subsequently have a little uh, blog post with, what is the what is the coolest episode or the most crazy episode you had with respect to data collection from some uh, one of our uh, camera bearers' experiences? So uh, I'm all ears if somebody wants to volunteer their anecdote. So since I generated the question, I can just uh, say a little bit about some of the, um, the, the challenge part. So I mean, for example, for social interaction, we really needed people, to, of course, to be interacting together by definition, but we couldn't bring together people really because of the pandemic. And so we came up with sort of a, um, 
a paradigm that the IR, our IRE approved, where as long as everybody was, all, we could involve participants who are already in the same household. And so we looked specifically for households of people with multiple adults, there couldn't be children, uh, had to be multiple adults. And then we would like, you know, pull up to their house, knock on the door, we would have uh, gloves and masks on, we would sanitize all the devices, hand them to the participants, and then they'd go inside and, and do their uh, activity for an hour and we would watch them disappear into into their home with like fifteen thousand dollars of our eye gaze equipment and hope that it came back out again in an hour um and so and, and you know we did this you know even when it was raining outside when it, even it was freezing we're getting frozen you know, it's very cold outside because we weren't allowed to go inside people's homes because of pandemic and so on so i think there's just really interesting so and that's just some of the things that we faced i know everyone else faced unique challenges and how they they chose to, to overcome this yeah I, I i think we must find a way to sort of capture this somehow it doesn't seem like the kind of thing that cvpr reviewers would appreciate but that doesn't mean it's not interesting. So we should have uh, uh, this aspect. I I'm going to turn the, the we, we have 20 minutes to go and I want to uh, turn the focus of this uh, discussion a little bit because we are lucky to have such a uh, such a erudite and wide uh, broad panel plus the audience. So I want to turn a little bit to uh, actions. So hands and objects and anticipation, which in my mind are quite melded together. I mean, this is, this is a, a favorite topic of mine, uh, uh, but I would like to hear from others. And basically, let me put it this way. I, I'm gonna ask uh, Chris, Giovanni, uh, Dima, anyone else who wants to speak, uh, I, I have some opinions too. Uh, what would be your dream? So five years from now, or let's say three years from now, three years or five years, pick one. How do you hope the field of robotics would have changed in response to Ego 40? Because we must dream, we must aim big, right? There's this line from Tennyson, a man's reach should exceed his grasp for what else is heaven for. So what is your dream about how the business of robotics will change as a result of Ego 40? So whichever one of you wants to take it first. I think Chris and I would agree that the, the object state change was really triggered by this idea of understanding how you can achieve goals rather than how you can do a specific action, right? Um, so you can achieve the same goal in many, many ways, right? Imagine you want to cut a piece of paper. You might use a cutter or you might use a scissors or you might just use you fold it and use your hand, right? The, the, there is a slight difference in the goal, but the goal can be achieved in a variety of ways. And currently, Robotics isn't even informed about this, right? There is, it's informed about one way of doing something and linking the variety of ways and how humans created tools, many tools um, to extend the, the, their hands abilities. And now you do your actions via naturally, via a variety of tools. You know what each tool can do. And you also know the the potential, like where, where it's beyond its potential, right? You can't use a, a scissor to, to open a, ta a, 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 a can of tin. So the ability to understand the variety of ways in which you can achieve a goal and how can you deal with the tools you have in hand, because you might not have access to all tools in the world, is my ultimate understanding of hand-object interactions. I have a variety of options in front of me. I know the goal. And I know how the many various ways of achieving the goal. And then I can optimize for maybe the speed I want to achieve it or how, you know, how um, high risk or low risk I want to achieve it similar to a human. Currently, actions in robotics still don't involve tools and still don't target goals. Um, and if we want to learn from human manipulation, we need to perceive those and be able to generalize to new objects and environments. Chris, your yep. thoughts? Yeah, so, you know, what, what would I like to see? So 10 years from now, um, I would like to have a robot in my house that, that helps me with things. So, you know, um, I hate folding my laundry. Actually, my wife does most of it and uh, it's not fun. But wouldn't it be great if I can show a robot, okay, this is how I would fold a shirt and here are my pants. 
and then the robot says, okay, you know, I understand what you're doing. I can use those skills and I can, I can fold this, this, and that also. So that kind of generalization ability that would be needed for both, both a perception and control algorithm. I mean, I think that would be, that'd be great, you know, in terms of, uh, 10 years from now. So there's a, a lot of uh, challenges to get there, but that's what I kind of see, uh, maybe from a, a selfish point of view, but that would be great. Giovanni, you've been uh, pushing anticipation for some time. So yeah, sure. how I anticipate your answer to this question. Yeah, sure. So my, my dream is to uh, see a uh, cooperation between human and robots. So if you want to achieve something like that, uh, you should provide robots with examples uh, of what uh, what you see, because uh, uh, when, when you see a person also, for, for instance, from behind, you can imagine what he's doing uh, in a kitchen because you learn it, because you, you have seen it uh, doing it. But in, in robots cannot do before learning. So probably this cooperation can come uh, exploiting both uh, point of, points of view, uh, at least at the beginning, and uh, streaming, for instance, uh, uh, forecasting uh, things and streaming information to, to the robots to, to have cooperation. And to do anticipation and also to support humans, um, you should do this uh, in, a, in a streaming way, which is uh, really far from where we are. The models are too complex. Uh, probably uh, the time, computation time, uh, surpass the anticipation time for the moment. So there is a long way to go to, to, do, to perform properly forecasting and to support humans uh, and uh, to do uh, human robot cooperation. Um, one thing I, I love as a, as a dream is to provide the humans uh, with a, a wearable device that can 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 provide um, uh, stopping humans where there are dangerous situations. I think that that is in my mind, and uh, um, it seems to be simple, but it's not there. So. Uh, until I, uh, I do, not, do not have a, a wearable device which stop me pushing a button, uh, still there is a way to go. Uh, it's not solved. So th that's my dream. Also, if it's small, stopping me pushing a button, uh, <laughs> the, the, the small part of the dream, and then I will think about the next one. And I, I can imagine uh, this for children. I think I'm kind of imagining this app where little kids have cameras on the top and now we can keep them safe as a result. But uh, oh. no, but uh, it's a great thought. Uh, Christian, you worked in this area too. You want to add something? Um, sure, I think um, I'm pretty fascinated by the potential of what robots could eventually do better by watching us and um, definitely, you know, wholeheartedly believe in the, the representation that was talked about earlier, Dima, Chris, with the um, state change. Um, also the ability, like I think Chichanya, you're asking, you know, what, if things went great, you know, what might Ego 4D change that people are doing in robotics? And like the, the fodder we have now is all this rich hand object manipulation. And again, I get, it's just thrilling to like, look at these samples, especially if you look at a bunch in succession from like all over the world, as I was, doing for fun, you know, making slides or this and that. And I mean, it's just rich and nimble and various. I mean, now we have a front row seat on it in this data. So that seems, you know, this might be the scale at which um, even for dexterous robot manipulation learning, you know, there's some mileage to be had um, trying to do this translation. So, I mean, the big, the big motivation being of course that um, rather than have robots that are, um, you know, expending energy and time physically in the world to interactively learn, they're still going to need to do this. But if we can prime them with the knowledge of people through the visual stream, for sure, and probably the, the other modalities or any ML modalities we can we supplement that with, um, then you kind of have a running start robot, the robot that's already envisioned and, and realized the effects of actions and so on to, to before the physical experience goes to augment that. I think one caveat or, you know, that that will be, you know, a 
a persist like an ongoing challenge nonetheless is like we're humans are already so skilled um, at doing daily life activity and like we're, if we're trying to bring robots up to that level um, you know we're giving them the expert demonstration through the video um, that usually goes well like we're usually able to fold the laundry or we're able to I guess the potter makes the pot and so on and so um, maybe there's research here of going from zero to 60 for your robot you know the humans like we love their demonstrations they are the experts but they're also the experts so like how to even through video potentially like take that kind of like a curriculum or how would that emerge when people are often showing us things very successfully yeah i i agree i i think uh, one of the challenges is that uh uh, robot, uh, I mean, I always rib my robotics colleagues about this. So my example is the following. I started in sort of computer vision and robotics in the early 80s at, in a lab at Stanford, which had both robotics and vision people. So at that time, for what vision people had was we had used to have like three images we used to run everything on and which somebody had somehow painfully scanned in with some technology, some homebrew technology. Okay. So that was then, and today, of course, we have like a trillion photos on the web and everybody is roaming around with a gigapixel camera and, and so on and so forth. Okay, okay. now uh, look at the robotics people. So at that time in the lab next to my office, they had robots and the robot had a parallel jaw gripper. Okay, and now I, when I go to my lab in Berkeley, at my, I have a lab, my colleague uh, Peter Veer has a lab next to my office in Berkeley, and he still has a parallel jaw gripper. Okay, so in 40 years, what has happened to images and cameras? And in 40 years, what's happened to robotics hardware? So, I mean, where are the multi-fingered hands? Where is the tactile sensing? Where is the sensing in the wrist? So uh, in a certain sense, there, there are severe hardware limitations. But I feel that, and what has happened is that the robotics people have been in a culture of poverty and they have reconciled themselves to this culture of poverty. So they, they've got this parallel jaw gripper, they write papers using the parallel jaw gripper. I hope that we will seduce them. We will make them see all the brilliant things that humans do in manipulating objects and dough and uh, everything else with their hands. And then they will feel jealous. They will want to do it. And then they'll want to give their robots that capability. So we all know that imitation learning is important. Learning from imitation uh, demonstrations. I mean, robotics people have talked about it. Child development people have talked about it. Even in the last five years, there are papers in the machine learning literature where very painfully somebody decides, okay, I want to learn how to pour liquids. So you collect your camera and you pour some liquids and you do some 10 demonstrations and then, and then you uh, write a paper on it. But this is like a one-off thing. This is like writing a paper on one image, which is what we used to do in the 80s and 90s. And now we are giving you hundreds of hours of hand-object interaction. So I hope it will change the field, but uh, this is, uh, so it is on my agenda is to go and proselytize to the, to the robotics community. Uh, we have uh, seven minutes left and maybe we can switch. We did something on social, we discussed a bit on the hand object and robotics -y things and uh, maybe episodic, but I see Bernard is, got his hand up and wants yeah so I, I i i want to follow up on this idea of what what the future will bring and uh in it you know the future looks bright but also there's a concern that comes up and um having hosted you know the activity net challenge for six years now uh, we've always been looking at like trying to you know increase the tent that people have work on video especially action localization localization tasks not not necessarily the you know, more simple like snippet classification, but localization where you have to consume the whole video. Uh, and a big issue that comes up is computational resources. You know, that this is the barrier to entry to working on these, well, activity net is now no longer a large scale by any means as compared to Ego 4D, but on those large scale data sets, that's, that's an issue. And so now as these data sets get bigger and bigger and bigger and Ego 4D is humongous and it's, I commend everybody on their efforts. 
do we feel a concern that this will is not necessarily increasing the tent of people that work on uh, uh, you know, let's say video in general, but more like reducing uh, the 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 number of groups that can do kind of high impact research that can make use of all this large scale data. One thing that comes to mind is like Matthew's rule, right? And I feel as the data gets bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, there's going to be this inequal computational inequality gap uh, will get bigger and bigger and bigger, and so. This is my concern. I mean, fortunately, I'm at a university where we have the resources for now, but in the future, when maybe there's even a bigger data set, that might not even be the case. And I think we should wrap our, our, our minds around the ways to, you know, uh, enabling people to more people to get into this uh, this field. Uh, I don't know what what everybody thinks about this. Dima has a hand up and I, there are a few questions on the chat. So if uh, people would volunteer from the panel to answer any particular ones, that would be great. And just raise your hand and then take up a question. Yeah, Dima first. I'll just pick up on Bernard's, which I think is a very interesting question. To me, um, there is a scope here in people picking up their subsets to answer interesting questions, as opposed to go and collect something in the lab uh, which they have control of, and it's really not really useful. So this is a, a pool from which, and that's how the benchmarks have been formed, where you kind of pull a subset that's trying to answer that question, but it is coming from naturally collected and wide and diverse data set. I don't expect for us at Bristol to be able to run anything on ego for the info, right? We, we probably are, will never be able to. But um, I think there is potential to, to allow these people to pick their to, to pull stuff without um, you know, doing the engineering bit of finding that sets that are not really gonna be interesting. And once they find these questions that people can scale from them, they might find a pool that's trying to do, I don't know, construction type um, building, and then we can take it and try it on another part of Eco4D until we've solved, we've carved out um, all, all the data sets potential. Um, and, and that's the coolest aspect. That's why we're putting it out. But I agree there is a prompt, always a potential of video and resources that will remain an issue. Video is still the hardest bit. Um, and we're relying on, on, on new innovations that lower the barrier to entry to people doing even the basic, even 10 hours of video. I wanna re reply to Bernard as well. I think this is a matter also uh, of governments uh, in the sense that, uh, well, industry is industry and the university is the public. And, and for instance, in Italy, um, there are new programs and uh, uh, a big supercomputer, probably the biggest one, uh, Leonardo of NVIDIA is, is coming and will be available for universities. So in some sense, uh, probably researchers should talk with, with the, with the the governments and uh, making this clear in order that they can invest and they can understand why we need. Uh, I, I know is is matter not of research, but someone has to take uh, uh, this uh, um, discussion with uh, with the governments. That that's one thing that I want I want to say. And in this moment, for instance, in Italy, they are investing a lot to habilitate universities to. Um, make progress on, on this side. Um, there was a question about, um, about data, positive data for dangerous situation or negative data. There are not those type of, uh, of uh, leveling in, uh, in for forecasting, but uh, actually what we need is to understand which is the next object you're going to interact with and why. Uh, then um, you can attach a sort of uh, um, of flag on, on which objects uh, you want to monitor in a, in a constrained environment, for instance, in industry, to uh, prevent uh, risks. And if you anticipate, you can, for instance, switch off uh, an IoT or giving you can give information with uh, AR. So, but in ego 4 d uh, the challenge is to anticipate uh, which are the next active object and how you are going to use. There are no positive or negative. Uh, labels for, for dangerous situations. I wanted to chime in uh, very quickly about the Q&A, so 
see if I can do it quickly. So the first one is about feedback. So Eagle 4D does not have feedback. So that means, you know, you're, the, the person wearing the camera is getting some information as they're recording it. Um, that might be the next big data set that needs to be collected. There was an interesting comment from a colleague, Serge Belangi, and he was saying, you know, maybe one day the day of fixed data sets will be done and data sets are going to be streaming. And so in that situation, you can imagine having feedback and that's coming back in and we have recording coming in. Uh, second question, um, you know, I, I don't work at Facebook, so I can't really comment on that. But one thing I wanted to mention was um, in the same way, deep learning has kind of exploded because we had algorithms, hardware, and compute. Um, I think this data set uh, is very historical because we have a huge mass of researchers in academia. We have a whole bunch of researchers in industry and a whole bunch of resources. And we are able to bring this all together for this project. And I think that is like momentous. So I did kind of want to speak to that. Thanks. Bhana, do you want to say something? Um, well, I mean, I had another, you know, kind of a concept in mind related to um, this continual Ego 4D, let's call it. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to have a hardware platform where we can, you know, deploy our uh, AI models and we can get such feedback? And I'm guessing these hardware platforms are maybe coming out of industry. And it would be nice if there's any plans, if anybody's heard of any plans for such a hardware platform. Um, that would be cool because it would be great. For, I mean, from the episodic memory uh, benchmark side, it would be great to actually deploy such you know, language retrieval, let's say, based uh, uh, techniques on an actual device that, you know, actually is recording your, your episodic memory. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think we we alluded to this, uh, it was there in Christian's talk that obviously an intended areas are in, such as AR, and AR is going to be, obviously be connected to the right kind of hardware and all of that. I, what we did in this project was to collect data from multiple kinds of hardware. So we were trying to intentionally be neutral with respect to that. But uh, in the future, we should expect uh, the hardware to evolve and uh, it should become lighter and take less power and weigh less and, uh, all, and uh, you know, all those good things. And uh, yeah, and that, that is to be, to be seen in the future. Bamsi, you want to speak to this? Yeah, just to add to the hardware aspect, I think uh, specifically from AV and social perspective, um, conversations are all really spatial, right? So there is a 360 associated with it. There is a there is a uh, there is a co-localization of ears. There's, there is a reason why we have two ears, not one ear. All this needs to be captured in egocentric as well, uh, and so. Even capturing spatialization, spatialized visuals, spatialized audio, uh, creating hardware, uh, even hackish hardware, which will allow us to sort of localize and capture at the same time and render it back, as you're suggesting, Bernard, render it back and bias uh, and bring the feedback in some form. All of those are great, uh, interesting future directions. And then I think like very much interesting to pursue. Uh, I know Jim uh, uh, had explored some of these uh, in the earlier version for the for, for V1, but for social, um, we couldn't move that uh, forward just because of the logistics, but this is totally on the cards. Yeah, and I wanted to answer one of the questions in the Q&A, which is how Ego 4D videos will help imitation learning or learning by watching videos. Uh, it's because we'll provide the data. I mean, we are not providing a specific solution. There are lots of groups which are working on this, uh, the same area of imitation learning or demonstration learning. And, and the, to put briefly, the challenge is generalization because uh, when different times you pour uh, some liquid into a glass, you're gonna do it in slightly different ways and you need to identify what's common across all of this. And this is a problem not dissimilar to identifying what's common to all cats and so forth. So it's a learning problem. And this is a topic of active research. And what we are providing is uh, data. And data, data, data. That's the most important thing. You know, There's this line from uh, 
uh, you know, Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes, the detective, says, data, data, I need data. I cannot make bricks without clay. So ego 4D is the clay. 